Straight out of the gates after getting certified, there are a lot of things to improve on in your scuba journey, but it's not very clear on how you can improve. Trust me, you're not alone. The gap between basic certification and pro level diving is super wide and it's not uncrossable. As a dive lover with a growth mindset, I've spent years gathering knowledge, practicing, taking certifications, and honing skills to bridge that gap. In this video, I'll share 25 rapid fire tips that will elevate your diving game at a much quicker rate than it took me, whether you're a beginner or looking to polish your skills. Let's start off by taking a look at a critical risk many divers often overlook. One major failure for beginners or even dive masters working with beginners is overweighting. They favor better down than up. But when things go wrong, this has led to fatal accidents. Get to know how to weight yourself properly, immediately. It's also nearly impossible to improve your buoyancy if you are not properly weighted. I cannot stress how important it is to know how to weight yourself. Don't trust anyone else. It's a skill you have to improve on. There are two weight checks that you should be comfortable performing. The first being sinking at the start of your dive with an empty BCD or buoyancy control device to eye level with full breath. Exhaling will allow you to sink and further, when you're done with your weight check, you should be able to just inhale fully to come back to the surface. Additionally, at the end of the dive, you should be comfortably be able to hold a three minute safety stop with a nearly empty tank of air. If you're having a hard time or you're trying to fight it at all, you're probably too late. It is important to note this is not a one-time use skill. You will constantly be moving your weight or adjusting it with different water temperatures, gear conditions. Being comfortable adjusting your weight properly is key. And here's a pro tip. Make sure you're logging your weighting and the conditions in a logbook as this becomes super useful as reference for baselines over time. So the next time you do freshwater, just look up your last freshwater dive and vice versa. You won't improve as a diver without this important mindset. I'm a firm believer that if you don't push past where you already feel comfortable, your skills will taper off and you won't continue to get better. Scuba diving has a huge umbrella of skills that constantly build on top of each other as you assume higher risk and do harder things. But you must also have the confidence and skill to offset that risk. Practice makes perfect and work with your dive buddy to watch each other, drill each other, and aim to give each other feedback so you can improve. Videoing each other helps substantially in this regard so you can reference it later. For tip number three, we'll put some important amendments to the last tip because some people are a little too comfortable breaking their comfort zones. Perhaps counterintuitive to my prior tip, you shouldn't do anything you have not already had proper instruction for. I can't stress the importance of this. I'm an avid diver, but this is not a proper course. This video and no videos you'll find on the internet are proper courses to replace proper instruction from certified professionals and specific classes that are hands-on to walk you through them. You will learn so much in those. I will go through them and I encourage you to go through them as well. The problem is when you push past where you have had the knowledge, the thing is you're assuming a lot of risk and maybe everything's fine. But if something is not fine, things can go south really fast and often the risk can lead to fatal accidents. That is why get the training first, then practice. And I hope these tips will build on top of that practice to make you a better diver. Some courses I highly recommend doing through an agency of your choice are open water certification. Of course, we should all be certified. Advanced diver, rescue diver, dry suit diving, deep diver, double cylinders, and nitrox. Also, I recently took a fundamentals class with GOO, Global Underwater Explorers, an agency I've learned about recently, and it totally kicked my ass into shape. And I highly recommend that course for anyone who thinks they got their skills together and want a challenge because this is really a fundamentals 
and I feel every diver should take this course at least to some degree because it's a higher bar than anywhere else I've seen and it will challenge you regardless of how you do in the course it'll challenge you to become a better diver and you'll learn lots of stuff from it. I just wanted to throw that in there as as a great class and a great learning experience. Tip number four. The people you're diving with need to be more than just objects in the water to which occasionally you look around for them. I've made this mistake in the past and as I grew as a diver I understood better how important Important it is to not just treat your dive buddy or your team as other divers experiencing something like it's some kind of tour. No, each time you go underwater, every single body in the water, a part of that team, and that's the key word, the team are essential for aiding and helping each other if something goes wrong. Your dive buddy, of course, is the minimum you should keep track of, but more importantly, if there are problems and you're always nearby your team, you have a lot of dive buddies to help solve a problem. This includes when starting a dive or ending a dive. Keep everyone around the same depth and close proximity. If someone is wandering and taking a picture, get the group to hold until all party members are ready to proceed. Don't leave this as the sole responsibility of the dive master. Treat the group as a team and help each other. The better you get comfortable that the dive master is more of that person who knows the logistics of the area and is trying to show everyone a good time, but everyone is a potential active member of the team, the better diver you will become. <laughs> Tip number five. Don't miss on important cues around you that if left unchecked could lead to a tragedy. Being situationally aware sounds easy, but in reality, it can be quite hard. This is because, especially as a beginner diver, there are a lot of things you have to learn and become good at. It's kind of like driving a car while trying to juggle and making sure you're aware of the crazy driver swerving over to your right. The more you practice, the better you will become. Be aware of where everyone on your team is around you. Inspect their gear for bubbles. Make sure they're streamlined and everyone looks comfortable and, most importantly, calm and safe. Pay attention to the current, the environment, and the wildlife around you. Take it all in and try to practice being aware of all these things so you are caught off guard less often. I promise, eventually it will feel like you are just driving a car, very relaxed even though you are juggling and you will see that crazy driver off to your right really quickly. Tip number six. It's easy to forget things before to dive. Here's how to avoid those mistakes. The amount of times I've forgotten something or failed to do something before the dive because I didn't do a proper buddy check or the times a buddy has found something that I forgot and I failed to catch before a dive is countless. It's best safe to assume you or someone in your group is gonna miss something. It's not a bad thing. It, just don't think of it as a bad thing. It's good. The more perfect you can be, that's great. And you should strive to be perfect. But until you get there, just assume so everyone's gonna forget something. It puts you in the right mindset. So you always do that buddy check. Do a buddy check with your teammate or do a team equipment check all at once. It helps to have a system where you work from top down and then right to left or left to right as you go down. Honestly, there's a bunch of different mnemonics and different agencies teach it a little bit differently. The main thing is have a system that allows you to do it consistently and the same every time. If someone doesn't know it, teach it to them very quickly. Checking things like, is your dive mask on? It's been defogged. The air tank is on as an important one. Do you have a full tank? Is it at 21% air or is it the expected air that should be in the tank? The regulator is working, you tested them, and the lines are not crossed. You would be amazed how many people get them all crossed. Follow the lines and make sure they're straight and not crossed anywhere. 
or underneath or through a loop or a strap. Make sure they're looking good. Take note of everything on the D-rings and straps. Are they properly clipped and streamlined? Nothing dangling. The inflator hose works after testing. Moving to your arms, your dive computer and compass is present and so forth. This system can be applied to cold water, warm water, and technical diving, and so forth. What I went over is not a real system, of course. I'm gonna leave that to you, or I have another video, which I'm happy to link up in the corner of this video. But the important thing is use your system and have it applied to cold water, warm water, and technical diving with practice and patience. It's a good thing to do before every dive as it will catch things. Tip seven. Don't neglect this fundamental and base skill which will be the pillar to all of your skills on top of it. I have dedicated several videos to buoyancy and plan to make more. I cannot do it justice here beyond comforting you that buoyancy is something that needs to be constantly practiced and with patience. We should always be trying to improve ourselves and never expect to be perfect. Striving to always improve and journaling how well you are doing goes a long way knowing how well you're progressing. Start by practicing trying to hold outstanding neutral trim at your safety stop and watch your dive computer. Practice pinning to an exact depth and control your buoyancy the best you can. Take note the maximum difference you had and that will be your deviation you should log. Whatever that deviation is, it's now a number and you can test it against that number and you should be trying to make that number smaller until you're able to hold a three to five minute safety stop with zero deviation. That's gonna take a while, but start practicing. As you get better, try closing your eyes for a period of time and keeping the rhythm. Check periodically how well you are able to hold that depth. You have to be careful with this. Your eyes close, so start with very small increments of time at the beginning. Further, have someone video you and comment how horizontally flat in good neutral trim you were able to remain on that safety stop. Tip number eight, the importance of an often overlooked life-saving tool. A DSMB or delayed surface marker buoy is a crucial and by my standards, a necessary tool for every dive. Many divers don't use them, let alone know how to use them. This should not just be your dive master's job. Let them know you'd like to deploy your DSMB at the end of the dive and get some practice in. They may still deploy theirs, and that's fine. Further, holding good trim and buoyancy during DSMB deployment is an excellent way to improve your buoyancy while task loading. You can signal to your team underwater, watch me, I will deploy the DSMB. You, 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 watch me deploy the DSMB. Practice and comfort is important with a DSMB to notify boats or people of your presence as you surface and more importantly, if you are separated from your team or caught in current, you want to notify others on the surface immediately. If you are swept away and no one knows where you're going, you could be lost at sea which is a real consequence you want to avoid. Deploy the DSMB immediately and then perform the decompression stops necessary for your safety as you go up. There is no rush to go up. You just want to get the DSMB deployed fairly quickly to notify others where you're going and then you can take your time. Tip number nine. We all know communication is important and yet neglect learning how to communicate underwater. Get to know the basic hand signs for scuba diving. There are not many and some basic safety signs are near universal with some slight tweaks. It opens the doors for being able to solve problems and work as a team without disrupting the dive. I understand a lot of hand signs change from different parts of the world just as language does, but I do see a common basic pattern in the signs used and those are primarily the safety signs. If you're interested in learning more about the basic signs, I don't have time to review them in this video, but I'll link it up in the card for you to go check out after this video. It took me a long time to really get these down myself, but after learning and practicing these base safety signs, I feel so much better and it helped me build a high level of confidence. 
Make sure your dive buddy and team have a base understanding too, which can often be worked out during the pre-dive meeting. And I'm not talking about the plethora of signs for wildlife. Those are important and fun, but focus on the safety ones first. Tip number 10. Don't let your expensive gear degrade into explosive hazards underwater. The important thing with salt water especially is it erodes everything. So properly rinsing your gear and getting all the salt water out of all those cracks will be necessary for longevity of your expensive gear. Even more vital is poorly maintained gear could lead to a critical gear failure beneath the waves which could put the dive and potentially someone's life at risk. Further, getting to know your rig and being comfortable taking it apart and putting it back together at least to some degree builds confidence and knowledge in your gear. Tip number 11. Look pro with your gear assembly as you walk over and prepare for the dive. Very similar to the buddy check tip, but one thing that was a game changer for me was being taught an efficient way to assemble my gear, checking and always putting it on in the same way in the same order. If you build a system of putting things on in a consistent manner and checking them before the dive, then you are less likely to miss things. A simple system, but to give you an idea of a quick system for this video, is to check the cylinder, inspect the o-ring, analyze the gas in the tank, attach the regulator, turn it on, check the second stages, the inflator hose, and the air pressure, check the weights, check to make sure the weights are in the pockets, then Clip off the air pressure gauge. Make sure it's not dangling anywhere, tuck it in somewhere. You don't want that thing accidentally smashed by the tank. Make sure none of the second stages are dangling. Inspect for anything dangling and out of place. Don your dive suit first. Put in your left shoulder first into the BCD. This is just a good practice to make sure when you put your arm through the BCD, then you can go ahead and attach your inflator hose and make sure your dump valve is clear of this strap. If you're in a wetsuit, you don't have to worry about it, but still we're building systems and it's just a system left arm first. Do it the same all the time, every time. You can make your own system, whatever works for you, but I encourage you to do it the same every time. Listen for leaks. Then put on the dive computer and compass. Put on anything you need in your pockets. Make sure your camera's squared away. Prepare your mask. Put your mask on backwards. Clip everything in at this time. Don't forget the cross strap. Double check for anything out of place or dangling. Double check your air is on. Ensure your long hose on the second stage isn't tangled. Clean up and tuck away your backup octo, and then you're set. Tip number 12, learning to prevent missing your dive site or being lost underwater. A compass can feel a bit foreign at first, but with practice, and all things take practice, you'll be comfortable with it and it'll feel natural to use. I usually like to get a bungee compass as it's a bit easier to change on the fly with different gear setups and make sure when you put it on, the window apparatus is facing you and I generally wear my compass on my left arm. The trick is to point it at your point of reference, ideally something that isn't moving freely, like a boat, a sea mount, something above the water, something that will be fairly stable and act as a point of reference during your dive. Pivot the turntable surface called the bezel so that one of the index notches matches the black arrow. That black arrow stands for north. Now to ensure you are moving towards your point of reference, you always want to line up your black arrow with the notch as you move. If the notch is getting too far away from the black arrow, you always want to move back in that direction and keep it aligned. Further, you can turn around and go back the way you came by lining up the notches on the opposite side, if your compass has them. Before the dive, having an idea of the north direction and where the boat is in relation to your point of reference in the terrain will help substantially with spatial awareness as well. 
compass takes a little bit of learning and you'll usually get some practice with it if you take advanced diver or a navigation course but i highly recommend you just take it with you and practice using it on your dives you'll get the hang of it and i know i blew through it very fast on this tip because it's rapid fire if you'd like a longer video i can make one tip number 13 if you know you have somewhere you need to improve don't solve it in the wrong way I like to think of gear as a means to achieve more with the skill you have, but one should not use it to solve skill problems. For example, being bad at air consumption does not mean you should rush to double tanks or a closed circuit rebreather. That's the wrong reason to be pushed in that direction. These tools can enhance your capabilities, but should not be used to sweep poor skills under the rug. Instead, focus on building your skills especially where you are most weak and seek knowledge on how to get there. Then the gear comes more naturally as a progression of achieving more technical challenges. Tip number 14, your rental gear may be holding you back. When I started diving, it took me a long while to buy my own gear. Rental gear works, but let me tell you, it was nigh impossible to improve my buoyancy skills above a certain limit with rental gear. Rental gear is designed to be a one-size-fits-all. It's meant to be flexible and durable, especially for beginners and not give you the flexibility you need to refine your skills. After buying my own gear and becoming familiar with it, it was truly a game changer and allowed me to start improving as a diver. I will say it's nice to go on a trip and not have to pack any scuba gear. I miss those days. But once you buy your gear, you will think it's worth it to lug it around. And also caveat, if you're one of those people who like to just be thrown random gear like rental gear and make the best of it and have the mindset I'm gonna make great trim out of any gear, then hats off to you, that's skill building. But still, I do think a lot of people and experienced divers will agree, it doesn't beat your own gear. Tip number 15, don't let the mysteries of decompression sickness scare you away. Decompression sickness is not the boogeyman that gets unsuspecting divers who have done something wrong. Even highly skilled divers are able to get decompression even doing everything correctly. If you are diving long enough, you will likely get it at some point if doing everything exactly the way you should be. I'm fortunate to say that I have not had decompression sickness yet, at least not to my knowledge. But I know many experienced divers, careful divers, and better divers than myself that have. Thus, as divers, we should acknowledge it's a real risk and do everything we can to reduce its risk. Speak openly about it and observe your teammates and be wary of the signs. Don't do standard things that can promote decompression sickness, such as exercising after diving, jumping into a hot shower, getting into a hot tub, climbing elevation, especially taking a plane. And of course, avoiding any rapid ascending while diving, obeying your decompression stops, and having a steady dive profile on your ascent, abiding to proper surface time, and drink lots of water before and after the dive. Water is super important. Drink lots of it and force it down. The research on decompression sickness continues. It's something we still don't know a lot about. But acknowledging its risks and checking in with your team is the best we can do after diving, especially repetitive dives. Symptoms to watch out for decompression sickness are abnormal fatigue, weakness, pain in the joints or muscles, dizziness, numbness, shortness of breath, rashes or itchy skin, confusion, coughing, and cold-like symptoms. Of course, unconsciousness, tremors, and amnesia as well. That's a big list and quite a scary list. One thing to stress is rashes, itchiness, and cold symptoms are in that list, which was a big surprise to me. I know I learned about these at some point, but it never really hit home until someone explained it a little bit more clearly. And I hope me explaining it here hits home for you as well. So watch out for those. Sometimes cold symptoms could actually be decompression sickness.
Tip number 16, learn to not just think of air in your tank as only your gas. I learned this recently from Goo Fundamentals course and honestly changed my perspective a lot as a diver. I used to look at my air gauge as a challenge to myself to make it last, but I would always think it as mine. And of course, I'd be willing to give it to someone in an emergency, but I never thought once, if there was an emergency and I needed to share my air, would I have enough for two people? It's a big perspective change, and now thinking a bit more on this concept of minimum gas, you would need to surface two people in an emergency from the depth that you went. Before you start your dive, you want to know what the minimum gas should be to surface with two people and make sure that is your bottom threshold for your own usable gas. And someone told me, and this has stuck with me since, that it is selfish to try and use or go below that min gas because you're putting someone else's life at risk. That stuck with me and it's a big perspective change. Tip number 17, you may not like this one, but it's critical for your safe diving and has many benefits outside of diving. Yes, that's right, fitness. Physical fitness is important for many things in diving. For one, the more fit you are, the less risk from decompression sickness. Further, fitness plays a big role in air consumption. On top of that, a fit body will be able to handle the heavy scuba gear better in and out of the water. Crashing to the ground with a full rig can be devastating to your body, so having the strength and balance to control that rig is a must. Further, if you are doing current diving, a fit body will enable you to keep up with finning without building as much carbon dioxide as an unfit body. Tip 18. How can you improve if you never put time and effort into building your fundamentals? I still consider myself largely a recreational diver. I very much enjoy looking at the fishes. Yet, the more I get into scuba diving and focus on improving myself, the more I see that skill building here and there on safety stops may not be enough. I now appreciate going to dive locally, setting up or using a fixed line, and practicing skills for an entire dive. I know this will make me a better diver and improve my skills. I consider it a must for leveling up my skill. One thing to note, you can pretty much set a line anywhere using your DSMB, potentially two DSMBs, and attaching some wire between them or just using one DSMB and using cave markers on it to just go up and down the line and uh, practice your ascending, descending, hovering, and your buoyancy control. Further, you can put a horizontal line and practice finning stably along it where you're able to hold the line, close your eyes, and see how well in a straight line you're able to go and holding your buoyancy and trim. It does help to have a buddy join you and do the skill building as they can videotape you. It's hard to see how well your trim is holding up until you watch a video of yourself. Tip 19, if your team is looking around wildly for you even though you're right behind them, something has gone wrong. If you ever look over and see a dive team with a bunch of folk in loose formation scattered at different depths, it will be hard to visualize that team being effective at solving an emergency. If there is a real emergency, they'll be lucky to catch it in time. If you are diving and able to see your teams over your shoulder or slightly back, you are in perfect formation to easily see and communicate with each other. This is the ideal position to work as a team and enjoy your dive together. However, there are legitimate exceptions for someone to rise up above others, perhaps to conserve air, in this case communicating with the team effectively and raising to a level where the rest of the team knows where that person will be is okay. It's a strategic move and the team has agreed to it. In this case, one person out of formation is still quick to check on. It becomes exponentially harder when there are several people. If there are several people that need to be raised from the depth, then the whole team can rise up. Tip 20. 
A dive torch can be used for more than just night dives. I've experienced the true power of dive torches, even for diving during the day as an effective means of communication as it allows you to get someone's attention from a distance and effectively communicate with members of your team and know their whereabouts without needing to look over. It is such a great tool because you can still be focused on looking at things and see people's dive torches and know they're nearby. If someone sees something cool, all they have to do is start moving their dive torch on it and everyone can focus in on it. It is a great tool for communication. Pointing your light downward in a spot where others can see it tells them you are there. Moving it around slowly side to side means you want their attention and they should look at you. Moving it around in a circle effectively means you are okay or you understand. So circling means okay. Lights allow you to communicate over distance and allow you to keep tabs on folk without needing to look around, so it's great means of communication. Just be careful not to blind your teammates or the local wildlife. If I want someone's attention at a distance, I could shine my light pretty close to their head, but once they start looking, make sure you take the light away. Tip 21. As a diver, you have a chance to represent and be an advocate for the world beneath the waves. Speaking of wildlife, it goes without saying, but as pro divers, we need to have the utmost respect for the wilderness. Too long have people trashed our waterways and destroyed the underwater environment. As custodians of the deep, we have a chance to make a difference and communicate to others when their behaviors may be destructive. Avoid touching coral or any wildlife. I even advise to not chase the wildlife. You're just gonna make it go away. I've even witnessed dive masters manhandle things to help other people get photos and see it more clearly. I understand why they do it and it makes people happy in their group. But as a pro diver, I want you to let them know that you prefer taking pictures without touching the wildlife or the reef. And field divers should stand to make sure that we protect the coral and the wildlife. And I've seen other divers grab that coral so they can take a really still shot of something very small. It's not okay. I understand there are emergencies and those should be avoided, but outside of emergencies, let's all see touching wildlife and coral as a critical failure of our skills and needs room for improvement. As mentioned earlier, I am also strongly opposed to chasing wildlife. Not only will you burn through your air, you will likely chase it off. I'm sure you won't feel good if local sharks start chasing you around to check you out. I do have an asterisk that I am not against spear hunting or anything of that sort. Just that as divers, viewing the world recreationally, we should respect the environment as much as possible and strive to leave it the way we found it, and even stand up for protecting it. We, as divers, are probably a few people that care to protect what is down there. Tip 22, how to avoid getting blown away from your dive sites. Current can make or break divers. It really puts your skills to the test and it can be overwhelming if you're not prepared for it. I would say it's good to have a solid foundation and confidence in your skills as a diver before exploring current diving, as current will put everything you've learned to the test. If there are things that do go wrong, like party separation or gear failures, it will be critical to be able to respond in a very small amount of time as everything is time critical in current diving. Start working up with current dives, being areas with a little bit of current. Work up to stronger current as a progression so you can build more confidence with being able to dive current before getting into something that can quite literally blow you away. I will say planned drift diving is still often beginner friendly as long as you have someone experienced helping plan it, but still party separation is a big risk even in drift dives. And if you're interested in learning more about current dives, I have a video on it up here I'll link above. Tip 23, being prepared for getting a little bit lost. 
Separation is something to be prepared for, and it is usually not a big deal if handled well. I've certainly made mistakes with this on my own dives, failing to follow proper searching procedure when we lost a member we were diving with. Everything turned out fine, it really just drove it close to home how I need to do better. Know and practice the drill for what happens if you lose your dive buddy or your team, and maybe your dive buddy's with you and you lose the team together. The team or buddy on the other side that lost you should immediately stop and try to swim back to the location they lost saw you, the lost member of the party. While the lost member should try to hold relatively close to where they lost saw the team or buddy and look up for bubbles. Shine the light around and ensure you've looked all directions. Stay there and keep looking. Look for those bubbles. Look above, that's critical. After a minute of searching, if the parties cannot find each other, it's important to end the dive on both sides. Deploy your DSMB immediately and safely begin to ascend. Once your DSMB is deployed, there is no immediate rush and you should ensure you do all your decompression steps along the way. Once at the surface, meet your team and it might still be possible to dive again. After a few moments, if you don't see the rest of your team, it may be time to call for help. And that's the critical reason why you have to abort to dive immediately on both sides. Both sides need to come to the surface if they can find each other because you just don't know if there's an emergency. You have to meet at the top and then if there's time, you can continue to dive, which is usually what I've seen now. Tip 24, take your air consumption model to the next level with this technique. You should be building a habit of checking your remaining air every five minutes, but building on top of that, try to start understanding your air consumption rate with regular conditions. Given you have a good and predictable rate of air efficiency and have stable buoyancy, you will start to find you can accurately start predicting your air consumption based on depth and will be able to estimate the rate of burn of your air at that depth. Practice makes perfect. So the next time you dive and you check the air gauge at the five minute interval, make a prediction of what your air will be the next time you check again in five minutes. This will start helping you build a super important model and relinquish some of your dependency on your air gauge. In event of an emergency or a dynamic dive plan change, you will be able to better understand the limits of your air consumption. Tip 25. How to practice and make perfect with neutral trim. Great buoyancy and trim is the holy grail of professional diver look. What you may or may not know is that neutral buoyancy is really a skill that builds off of the culmination of many skills that we've reviewed prior in this video. For one, you need good buoyancy as the foundation to improve your trim. You need good finning technique to not break your trim. You need to be able to perform skills and task load while keeping trim. You may need to configure and rebalance your rig to even hit neutral trim. It takes practice, but it's a skill that will make you look pro and feel pro. More importantly, it is super efficient in the water. There will always be room for improvement and is something that will get rusty after not diving for a while. It's a perishable skill. If you have gear changes, you may need to mess around with and reconfigure them between dives until neutral trim feels right. It is important to know that many of these tips in this rapid fire style were meant to create a nice list for you, but I had to go over them very quickly, so let me know what you'd like more detail on and subscribe to hear about future videos that will definitely delve a lot deeper on our quest to become exceptional divers. But first, I have one additional bonus tip for you. Would you believe that there is a way to vastly improve your diving experience, time diving, and feeling better after every dive? Believe it or not, it's true. And I go into detail on this next video here. Until next time.